hearing none, I, I think we'll we'll dive into this topic. And uh, appropriately for that request, what we're going to be talking about here is going from particle filtering what to particle filtering how. And the material today has a conceptual side, um, but it also is an extraordinarily practical side. There's a lot of math involved, but what's what I'm hoping everyone will take away here is certain take away from this lecture is, is certain key understanding and indeed intuition that's extremely important for using the particle filter in practice. Okay, and it has to do with this notion of important sampling uh, and and with representing a distribution as a set of samples. In this case, samples called particles. I noted that we're going to be pursuing a bit of R code here. And so I, again, invite people, I'd done it earlier, but some have come in since then. I'd invite you to call up an R session or an R studio session, either will do, because we'll be actually typing some code that will start to, to illustrate this. Um, so last time we talked about what particle filtering was accomplishing. Um, and we're seeking this time to, to get us closer to how we actually go about implementing, uh, enacting that previous and the previously covered theory for, for uh, in terms of the distributions. So there's a key question at the root of a set of these algorithms we've been covering for a while now. MCMC, approximate Bayesian computation, particle filtering, uh, and indeed particle MCMC. Um, the problem that each of these addresses in a different way is if we have a distribution, and typically it's a posterior distribution, we want to sample from it. We want to draw values from it. How do we do that? And in particle MCMC, we had a distribution over parameters. And we had this kind of clever way of walking around the space of possible parameter values. At any one point in that space, being able to evaluate the posterior distribution. And then choosing candidates for where we go to next and either going or not going to them according to a ratio of posteriors. That was one approach for sampling parameters. Here we're actually sampling from late from latent states of the system. Um, but we have a, a problem that conceptually is, has some similarities. Uh, and specifically, there's a distrib a target distribution that we want to draw from which we want to draw. And we want to want to draw samples from it. So we have some distribution of unknown shape, typically not parametrically stated. It emerges from a simulation model. And we want to draw values from it. We, we want to be able to, to sample from it. We want to be able to, to, to draw possible values, possible values of the, the latent state of the system, for example, from this. Um, so we have this thing called a target distribution. That's the one we want to sample from, from which we want to sample. And at a, both a practical level and a conceptual level, it's of key relevance to understand that what we're dealing with here is something called the importance sampling. Um, it's, it's not pursuing the approach of MCMC because the dimensionality is far too high to sample from latent states over time. The latent state itself might have 
10 compartments, 50 compartments, a large number of compartments at any one time. And then we want to sample from it over time. There's just no way we can do that like we do with MCMC, where we're, we have a certain place and we're drawing a value and that's, that's perturbed from it, that's, that's sort of displaced from it slightly, and we evaluate the posterior distribution for that. It's, it's generally not, not possible. Um, it's far too high dimensionality. And we also here can't directly turn some estimate of latent state into, say, an estimate of what's the value of the posterior for that. Instead, particle filtering uses another means of sampling, what's called sequential importance sampling. And this is super practical. And when you use particle filtering, you got to understand this is what's going on, or you'll use it unsoundly. Um, I've seen students who, when working with particle filtering, do something that just doesn't make sense conceptually because they didn't understand the notion of important sampling. So we, we need to understand it. And it turns out it's really easy to use, and it's very practical to use. It's very very uh, favorable to use. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to use this notion of important sampling to draw from a target distribution. We have some distribution we want to draw from. We're going to, we're going to draw it. How do we do it? Well, it's, it's, we're going to go through a two-phase operation. We're going to draw first from a proposal distribution. And then we're going to use weights, which relate the proposal value of the proposal distribution to the value of the target distribution to get a series of weighted samples. And then we're going to draw from them with the probability associated with the weight. Um, OK, so the idea here is suppose we have a target distribution. We have some distribution we want to draw from. Maybe we have a bunch of empirical data. Maybe we have uh, that gives relative frequencies of seeing certain outcomes. Maybe we have a simulation model that where we can compute the posterior um, uh, for uh, for a given value of 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 uh, the the post the um, the parameters. What have you? Suppose we want to draw samples from a, a distribution, um, but we don't have a way of directly doing that. Well, what we do is we take another distribution, Q. This is called a proposal distribution. So we want a sample from the target distribution. We have a proposal distribution. And the proposal distribution is chosen at our convenience. It's chosen so we can sample from it easily. And we sample from this and then weight those samples and then draw from the weighted samples. The samples will be weighted based on the relationship of these two. So we'll basically draw samples from the proposal. We'll adjust them, not numerically, but in the sense of giving them a weight so that when we draw from them according to their weight, we get values at p of x, the proposal distribution. OK, um, so what's going to happen here is we want to draw from p of x. And we'll draw from it in a four-part procedure. I said two, but I'm splitting two of the steps further here. This is the four-step procedure. Suppose we want to draw n values from a distribution p of x. By the way, these samples will be called particles for particle filter. They are the particles. OK, so what do we do? First, we create a, sas, a set of n sample values from the proposal distribution, this thing that it's convenient to sample from. Maybe it's a uniform distribution. Maybe it's a normal distribution. Q of x is not what we want to draw samples from ultimately, but it, it's going to be a step there. So we draw from what we have. Great, the proposal distribution, Q of x. Awesome. Step one. So we want to sample a thousand parameter values from P of X, 
And instead, we sample 1,000 from Q of X. You may say, well, how does that get us any closer? Well, just wait. So each of these sample values, we will assign a weight to it. Those are the weights in particle filter. And that weight is the ratio of what we want to get, the, the, the sample fr from the value. Uh, so this is a sample value X sub I, some particular number. It's a sample with, with a particular number associated with it. And we ask, what's the probability of that occurring with the target distribution compared to the value for the proposal distribution? Notice that in, in saying, what is the value of the target distribution for the sample. I'm not, I'm not drawing from the proposal distribution. That's what we want to be able to do. That's what we're going through all these steps to do. No, I'm just asking, what's the value of the target distribution at that point? So we have a target distribution that gives us, say, a posterior value at each point. And we can evaluate it at a given point and say what the posterior value is at that point. And we're going to take the ratio of that value to the ratio of what the proposal distribution, the value of the proposal distribution is at that point. So maybe we've sampled the value 13 and we're saying, what is the density of the target distribution at 13 compared to the proposal distribution? Okay, um, so we have these samples from the proposal distribution. Now we're going to weight these according to this ratio. And then we normalize the weights. It's actually not, not as important here. But here's the thing. So we, we have a bunch of samples from Q of X, N of them. But we have a, we, each one of them has a weight now that reflects its relevance or its, its um, how frequently it is represented in the, in the target compared to the proposal. And then we're going to draw samples from that set of samples that we originally drew from, from the proposal distribution. But instead of just drawing them willy-nilly with equal probability, we're going to draw them from that set with a probability equal to the weight. So we say we draw them by weight, meaning those who have twice as big a weight are twice as likely to be obtained um, as those with a, a smaller weight. So here we're going to have sub distribution we want to sample from, that's P of X. And instead, we're going to have this distribution that's easy to sample from, say, uniform distribution. We draw from that, and then we, we weight them. We weight these samples. So sometimes from the uniform distribution, we'll get a sample here. And we weight that sample by the ratio of what it is, what the value of that sample is for the target distribution versus this proposal distribution. We'll do that for another sample. Over here, you'll see the target distribution is a lower value, of lower density at that point than does the, the proposal distribution. So the weight will be less than one because it's Q of X in the denominator, P of X in the numerator. So we get a set of weighted samples. They're samples from Q of X originally, but we have a weight for each of them. And then we will draw them accordingly. Um, okay, so I wanna, I wanna show this. So I asked you to call up your R's or your R studio. And this, this process is actually quite easy to undertake here. Um, in R, and I'd, I'd like to do it. Um, it's, it's, it's important at a practical level. It's important at a conceptual level. So um, what I will do is, uh, rather than distracting you with this, I am going to close that, and I will go call up uh, our studio and I'm going to close this and we'll just start from scratch, okay? Um, so we don't need to load any libraries or anything here. What I'm gonna show you is the distribution from which we want to draw. This is our target distribution. 
we want to draw from some distribution p of x. And I, I'm going to show you some weird looking distribution we're going to draw from, OK? Um, uh, I'm going to show you what it looks like. Don't get worried about what this is. I'll just show you a nice picture. OK, so um, this distribution is going to uh, have have a shape to it, and we're going to learn how to draw it, draw from it using uh, using uh, these this principle of important sampling. So, what I'm going to show you is what this looks like. Um, I'm going to uh, show you a draw from a beta distribution. Okay, beta distributions. If you want to go look it up, you can you can do so. Um, oops. Um, in uh, in Wikipedia or whatever, but it's going to look like this. Okay, I I happen to to show it here with an R, but it's just to show you what it looks like. So you might say that's a funky looking distribution, and it is. It's a funky looking distribution. Um, it goes between zero and one, and each point here has has a certain probability of being of our current. Now, suppose we wanted to draw from that distribution, but we didn't have a way to draw from it. We didn't have, suppose R couldn't tell us how to draw from that. R is powerful and it knows how to draw from it, but, but suppose we didn't have that ability. How would we do it with important sampling? Well, it's actually quite easy. We, we want to draw from this, but we don't have a way. So we start with what we do have a way to do, and we, we can draw from a uniform distribution. So, um, so if we want to draw, let's say, uh, 100,000 samples from this distribution, we'll start with 100,000 samples from our proposal distribution. That's this one here, Q of X. That's what we can sample from, a uniform distribution. Any old computer, even Excel, can let us sample from a, a uniform distribution. OK, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to tell R to draw 100,000 samples from a uniform distribution. Now, um, the question then is, what's its min and what's its max? And I showed you a distribution here that goes from 0 to 1. That's its support. That's the range over which it. And the, the domain over which it, it, it spans. So um, we'll use a uniform distribution from between zero and one. We're going to draw one. We're going to draw values from a uniform distribution. OK, so let's do that. So I'm going to say proposal samples here. And I'm going to do this left arrow, meaning it gets, um, it's, it's getting these values. We're going to draw from a uniform distribution with n equals 100,000. OK, so we're going to draw 100,000 times from this uniform distribution. That's our proposal. And it's going to be with a min of 0 and with a max of 1. OK, um, so, so what are we doing? We are drawing from this proposal distribution, Q of X. That's what we know how to draw from. Um, and we're going to turn that straw into gold uh, by being able to weight it so we could actually use it to draw from this funky distribution. So here we go. Here's our proposal samples. And we're going to run it. Now, these proposal samples are drawn from a, a uniform distribution. And if we were to look at them, if we were to say, you know, proposal samples, and we were to look, excuse me, at the first 20 of them, we'd see all sorts of values here. Uh, uh, but these samples are samples from a uniform distribution. If we plotted them, if we said hist to do a histogram of them, of these proposal samples, what we'd see is nothing like the funky distribution we want. We want this. And instead, what we got is stinking values from this uniform distribution. 
from our proposal distribution. So this proposal distribution here looks nothing like this one we want to have. It's, it's, you know, it, what we want is this draws from from this, and instead we got all we got were these stinking sort of values. But this isn't where we stop. Um, we're going to give weights to these values. And those weights will provide all the difference because they'll let us draw from these in a weighted way, a way that doesn't draw willy-nilly, but, but draws from them in a way that, that is much more savvy. So how are we going to do that? Okay, well, we've got our draws, for, we've got our samples from the proposal distribution. For those trying to relate it to this, we've just done step one here, okay, uh, part one. Um, now we got to label these with weights. Okay, we got to label them with a weight for what the value would be for the target distribution compared to what it will be for the proposal distribution, the ratio of those. We got to wait to sort of say, hey, we care more about things whose values in the, uh, in the target distribution are, occur much more frequently than they do in the, in the proposal distribution. That's what this ratio means, right? If, if, it's, if, if this ratio is high, it means it's occurring a lot more, this value X sub I is occurring a lot more in the target than it is in the proposal. So we give it a higher weight. We say, this is a more important one because it's, it's more representative of what P of X has to, compared to Q of X. And we, we wanna see lots of these because they're, they're underrepresented in draws from Q of X and they need to be represented a lot more to, to represent P of X. So each of these samples we drew already, each of these samples that we drew has got to be weighted. Okay, so we're going to assign weights to these things. Cool. Dr. Oscar, quick question. So yeah. the Q of uh, the, the, the simple distribution that you picked should have the same range of your data, right? That you the, want to replicate. Yes, with a, I mean, this Q of X could go over a much broader period, but it'd be pretty wasteful if it, if it did, right? Uh, in other words, Q of X here, if it extended out twice as large, like, in fact, there's an illustration of it. If it were, if it were far larger in its support than what you, than the distribution you want to sample, the, the P of the target distribution, this would be really wasteful because you'd have a lot of these samples out here uh, from the proposal distribution that give really, have basically zero weight because the ratio of P of X to Q of X would be, uh, you know, would be essentially zero. So they'd have no weight. You'd be carrying around a lot of dead weight okay. by all these samples out here. Um, and it can be smaller because ah, we need to make sure. Exactly, yes, okay. yes. And that's what I was about to say. If, if Q of X were too small, if it were too narrow, then, then Q of X would be zero for some of these places, right? Like um, some of these out, outliers in, or some of these values in P of X that are further out, Q of X would be zero, in which case, you know, weight, weights wouldn't be defined. It would, it would be, uh, we need an infinite weight in which we can't have. So yeah, we need Q of X to be at least as broad as P of X, but we'd like it to be pretty well matched over its support to avoid being inefficient, if that's helpful. Yeah, and by the way, this is same sort of philosophy that goes on in particle filtering. We don't want particles carrying a lot of dead weight. We don't want tons of low weight particles carrying around. The burden of having all these particles contributing almost no weight. And so the resampling process is what sheds those dead weight ones and basically resamples to to get particles that focus in on this region here that are close in support in, in their range to what we want in the target distribution. Um, okay, so uh, is that helpful? Yes. Okay, great.
Okay, so let's go weight these, right? We have these samples and we want to weight each one. What do we do? We weight it by the ratio of P of X to Q of X. So the weights here are going to be the ratio of, of, of the thing we want. This beta distribution with shape one equals 0.3 and shape two 0.4 compared to the value of the uniform, the, the value of the of the density of the uh, of the proposal distribution, which is uniform. So here we go. Weights will be the ratio of d beta. That's the value of the beta distribution at a certain point. Um, and specifically, we want to know what's the value of the beta distribution at each of these points um, compared to as compared to, in other words, divided by the, the value of, the, of the, um, the, the uniform distribution. So I'm going to say D beta uh, proposal samples. So for each of these, um, each of these X sub I, I'm going to compute. So these are the samples we drew. I'm going to compute the ratio of the target distribution at that sample compared to the proposal distribution at the sample. So that's what I'm doing. D beta at that sample where D beta has shape one equal 0.3 and shape two uh, equals 0 0.4 um, divided by, so that was P of X. So we have a, we, we have a, for each sample, we're going to compute the ratio of beta for it versus uh, the value for a uniform distribution. Um, that's Q of X here, where we're going to have a, a min and a max, right? We're going to have a min of zero, excuse me, uh, for, for this sample. So we want to know what's the value of the uniform distribution at this sample with a minimum of zero and a maximum of one. That's the, the, the parameters for the uniform distribution. So we're figuring out for each sample, what's the ratio of the beta at that sample versus the uniform at that sample. We're just performing this cal calculation here where P is beta and Q is uniform to calculate the weight. So each weight will be for a particular proposal sample, the corresponding proposal sample, it'll be the ratio of these. So if we, if we press this and we look at the first 20 of these, we say weights one through 20, each of these samples from the proposal will have a weight. Where did this weight come from? Well, the first weight came from what is the value of the beta distribution at, this is an X sub I at, at that point versus the uniform distribution. So this, this weight came from what is beta at this point divided by uniform at this point. Um, that's exactly where this came. This here came from what's beta at this point compared to uniform at this point. And it's 1.75 uh, in that case. So so these are the weights. Each weight came from a corresponding X sub I, a corresponding one of these. Um, okay, any questions about that? What I've just e done? E yes, yeah. just a quick question. So in reality, we don't know the beta distribution, right? You're just using beta as an example. I'm here. using it as an example here. So, so what would yeah. you do if you just have a bunch of numbers bunch of samples these are the observations and yep. we don't know what's the underlying distribution yeah so uh what you could do first of all if you have samples in the first place um and you want more samples of that sort one one easy thing you could do is is you know compute a uh i mean you you can draw samples with replacement from that set of samples you know if you had samples from the world, uh, let's suppose you had a hundred observations from the world. I mean, you could always, you could always, you know, draw from those yeah, many times, it, yeah. but uh, yeah, you bootstrap it, or you could compute a histogram of them. And then you could draw from that 
histogram on exactly that method where this would be would be basically um, well you'd, you'd be using essentially the next um, uh, yeah, so you you could you could have this be basically the value of the of the histogram for those samples divided by your proposal distribution. What okay. I'm showing you is the basic principle of important sampling here, and what we'll see is that in particle filtering, we use this approach. We have weights, we have a proposal distribution. And we can sample from a distribution that we can't even draw out, right? We don't know what its parameters are or anything. But we do have a way of carrying around these weights, which represent this ratio. That's what's going on in particle filtering. We have weights that we are updating over time in particle filtering that conceptually re represent this, uh, this um, quotient, this uh, um, you know, the ratio of these two distributions. We have a proposal distribution, which by the way, is just running the model forward, gives you your samples from the proposal distribution. And then we have a way of basically getting this weight in light of the samples from the proposal distribution. We have a way of calculating the weights where those, each of those weights is a ratio of a, of a, a the target distribution to the uh, to the sample distribution to the proposal distribution, yeah. Okay, so we have weights here, um, and uh, you know our our goal is to sample from beta. We actually sampled from uniform with these sort of things, and now I claim with these weights, if we draw from these samples with a probability of drawing each according to the weight. We draw from these proposal samples, which you show here, but instead of drawing them with equally likelihood, I draw them with the likelihood of drawing it equal to the weight, I will be sampling from the target distribution. Let's do that. Let's go do that. So here we go. We're going to use uh, this, this method in R which is called samples, okay, or sample. So I'm gonna say target, oops, um, target important sample, samples. And what is it going to be? Well, I'm going to sample from these proposal samples, okay? I'm gonna draw from them. Um, and, but I'm not going to draw from them with equal likelihood. I'm gonna draw from them with a likelihood given by the weight. So I'm gonna say prob equals weight. Okay, so the chance of drawing a given one of these will be given by its corresponding weight. So the chance of drawing this one will be given by its weight. Oh, this one has a high weight. So this one will be gotten more frequently. By contrast, uh, something like this one, will be uh, only obtained, you know, 58% of the time it otherwise would have been. Um, and this one here would be obtained even less. Um, it would be obtained with a probability equal to this. And then I'll say replace equals true. I mean, draw with replacement. Okay, so what have I done? Well, let's, let's go back to the algorithm. I, I went through, I created, the first thing I did is I created a set of samples from the proposal distribution. That was your proposal distribution was my uniform distribution. Each of them I labeled with a weight. That, that's what I did here. I labeled each with the weight that reflected the quotient of the, the um, value of the target distribution at that, at that a sample versus the proposed distribution it reflected how much more frequently this sample occurs for the for the target compared to the proposal. Um, I didn't bother normalizing the weights because R handles this automatically, but then I created a set of samples which were drawn with probability according to the weight. That's what this last step did. And what I would claim is that having gone through these steps, I've actually drawn values from this original distribution. Let's, let's go test it. Let's go 
do a histogram of these important samples. So here we go. We'll say hist of these. And there we go. Okay, so these are the samples that I have drawn through this four-step procedure. Um, they are drawn from the proposal samples, but the proposal samples were, were you know, if, if you draw for them in an unweighted way, you just get the proposal distribution. That's, that's what this shows. Instead, I drew from them in a weighted way and I got what I, um, what I wanted to see, which was the, the target important samples. And you'll notice that that's very, very, very similar to what I was aiming to reproduce. So what I have done is through this four-step procedure sampled from a distribution I really want to sample from using samples drawn only from a proposal distribution that's easy to sample. In this case, it's uniform. Now, I'm going to ask you for your exercise to do it with something other than uniform. I mean, this Q of X could have been a normal distribution, you know, something which went way up here. The point is Q of X should, the proposal should be something that's easy to sample. from. And, uh, and by going through this four-step procedure, I find a way to sample from this target distribution. Now, the beautiful thing here is that we don't have to have any sort of special form stated for P of X, um, right? It doesn't have to be a parametric distribution. Um, it could be something arbitrary. And in fact, within particle filtering, we actually, don't have a way of directly um, determining the value of P of X at any arbitrary point. X there is a latent state. We don't have a way of doing it for an arbitrary latent state. But what we do have with particle filtering is a way of carrying around these samples called particles, determining the weights for them. That's what the weights are in particle filtering. And then we can draw from them with the probability according to the weights. The net upshot of this for particle filtering is never, ever draw from the uh, set of particle values, except draw, uh, unless you draw it by weight with a probability of drawing it by weight. It does not make sense to talk about the values of the particles um, without drawing from them with a chance of drawing each proportional to its weight. That is how important sampling works. That is how in important sampling we draw from the target distribution is we have weighted values in the proposal distribution. We never consider them in an unweighted way or else all we get is the proposal distribution. And that's not what we want. So important sampling lies at the heart of why particle filtering works. It's all an important sampling method. But how we actually compute the weights, how we, uh, we actually arrive at the samples from the proposal distribution will be more involved. And I'd like to, to talk about this. Any questions about this, though, um, about this basic idea, we want to draw from one, one distribution and we can't do it easily. We draw from one where we can do it, and then we weight the we weight the samples so that we can, in fact, draw from the proposal from the target distribution by drawing from the weighted samples. Any questions about that? Because it's it is foundational for particle filtering, and it's very useful elsewhere. I see there's a message in the chat. Does the weight have any similarity with the uh, kullback liebler divergence? Good question. The kullback liebler, liebler divergence um, provides a way of summarizing the difference between two, um, between two distributions. But it's, it's more than that. Um, it, that. That's roughly what it does. But it actually says how much value it's, it's directional. So it's asking if you have uh, distribution A and distribution B, um, to what degree uh, is A um, gathering more information than, 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 than B, providing more information than B? 
um, it's, it's not undirectional. It's not just saying, how do they differ? It's saying, um, uh, compared to B, um, to what degree does A um, refine B in some sense? Uh, and the weights here, um, I'd have to reflect, you know, go back and, and, and dig into the Quebec Liebler divergence, but I think it's actually rather different. Um, Quebec Liebler divergence isn't, um, uh, I think, seeking to directly transform distribution B into distribution A, but there may be a weighted part of it that I'm not thinking about. It's not a crazy idea. You could think of P of X as like an adjusted version of Q of X where the adjustment is performed by the weights and sampling according to weight. So it's not a, at all a crazy idea. It's an interesting idea. Um, I've never thought of it that way, but I will um, see if I can refresh my memory of the Quebec liberal divergence. This is something we've used in some of our work with, uh, with simulation models and, uh, and empirical data. So other questions though about this basic idea of important sampling, this idea of having weighted samples is another question here. Great, uh, yeah, I'm glad to offer those comments. Any, any other questions though about this? Okay, I'm not seeing anything in the chat. So anyone? Okay, so, so, so let's talk uh, a little bit about this in the, in about what's going on here. So you may be confused that we're drawing values from distributions. Um, so, so I'm saying we, we want to sample from P of X. Instead, we sample from something easy like Q of X, and then we weight things. And we, and we somehow get something that approximates P of X. So we wanted to sample from, from this. We actually sample instead from this and by weighting and drawing from the weighted samples, we get something like this, which is very, very similar to what we wanted to, to sample from. Great, um, but what's going on? Well, um, we're representing here uh, a distribution, P of X, as a weighted set of samples. And um, the, the weights here are given by the ratio of the value of the target distribution at a, at a sample versus the proposal distribution of a sample, right? And the way in which this is commonly written is this thing called the direct delta distribution or, or probability mass impulse, unit impulse function. Um, this is something that holds the value um, Q of I. And the idea is that um, we, we have some representation of unit probability that's sort of infinitely narrow. It's kind of the, lim the limit of something as you, as you consider it getting narrow and getting taller. Um, at a certain point. And so we represent kind of a distribution P of X as, as, a, as a whole bunch of samples from it. Um, uh, and uh, each of those is kind of a bit of probability math. So P of X has some overall, you know, if you integrate it, you, you get one, but it's, uh, it, it has some mass between any two points. Um, and we're representing as a sum of samples. Maybe it's a uh, hundred samples. Maybe it's a thousand samples. Maybe it's ten thousand. Maybe it's a hundred thousand. But collectively, we're kind of summing those samples up, um, each representing kind of a different part of this distribution. So you can imagine approximating this distribution with a lot of of these values that are kind of. Um, uh, each have some weight associated with them, um, and they each have some mass. So there'd be a lot of samples um, collectively with high mass for areas where this is high, and for areas where it's low, there'd be very few samples. Um, that's that's kind of what we want from for this target distribution. If we 
want to represent the target distribution with these particles, these samples. We want a whole lot of, of collective mass. Maybe it's um, a lot of samples with small weights. Maybe it's um, a few samples with really large weights. But one way or the other, we want a large collective set of, of sample weights for regions where it's high and very small ones for regions where it's low. Um, and then we draw from them according to their weight, of course. Um, okay, so here in particle filtering, each sample is importance weighted and it's represented by, we call a particle. A particle is an importance weighted sample. Its weight indicates its frequency of occurrence. Um, and at any one time of running a simulation model, the particles reflect the state of that model over the time. They're samples from that distribution. We're representing a distribution as these bunch of samples from it. And the particles, the particle filter, are representing the distribution over the state of the model. Um, and when we want to compute statistics on those, when we want to graph out how it's doing or compute, you know, compare it to the empirical data, look at how tightly its distribution lies around the empirical data, we always draw, we always sample from the particles. So for example, if, um, if you were, were to look at some of uh, the outputs from these things like here, um, you notice these kind of uh, uh, these kind of fuzzy distributions around the empirical points. The magenta ones or maroon ones are the empirical points, and the blue ones are are the um, the samples from the particles. Um, similarly, if you were to look at um, you know these these are draws from a distribution. Those are defined via sampled particles. So we're sampling from that, determining what the value is for whatever is being plotted from each sampled particle and, um, and, and plotting that out in a density plot. That's what's, what's going on here. Okay, so um, uh, here the, the particles are these samples and we always sample them to deal with them. It, again, it doesn't make sense to, to deal without to plot them without sampling them. That doesn't make sense. You you sample from them. That's what that's what it it is. It, it's necessary to be meaningful. Um, each particle is associated with a copy of the model state, right? It, it has a value for s, for e, for i, for r, the contact rate, any any dynamically varying parameters. That's what that's what's associated with each particle. And as a normalized weight, and it's the, the important sampling weight. Um, and then the survival of the fittest is basically taking these deadweight particles and dumping them and essentially resampling. So we arrive at a new set of samples um, that are the old set of samples, um, but where we've drawn from them according to weight. And so those will tend to uh, align more closely with wherever the, the posterior distribution is, the, the, the target distribution from which we want to sample. So if we have all these samples then in particle filtering that are sitting like way out here um, with very low weight, and then we have some in here with quite high weight, once we do resampling, very few of these will survive the resampling process. The survival of the fittest process will um, almost certainly lead to extinction for these. And the ones that will survive will tend to be, will tend to be clustered right in this region, right around this, um, uh, this target distribution. Um, so this is survives the fittest. Um, and uh, Dr. Oz, a quick yeah. question, if you go back yeah. to that uh, uh, yeah. graph right yeah. here. So yeah. let's assume that um, after your particle filtering resampling for, um, you end up being with that blue distribution. So you're, you're getting yep. rid of everything outside. Mm -hmm. And um, all your remaining samples are within the shape of that blue one, right? So you you don't have any. I'm assuming you don't have any more samples in the like outside range, right? You got rid of them because you primarily yeah. picked the ones that are that, that that is that is correct for this point in time. 
point in time. So, so if then, so we are not generating new particles, right? So we are starting with the initial set and we just like progress them in time and then uh, resample them as we go forward. Correct. So if like a ton, 10 times step from now or 20 times step from now, all of a sudden we have an observation that is way out. Yep. Yep. And then we don't even have a particle that is close to that observation that we can just like then start capturing that pattern. How is that going to happen? Okay. So, so you've asked a very good question and there's a key point that you need to consider. Um, okay. So when I said I emphasized after resampling, the particles that are that are from out here with very low weights are unlikely to survive, right? Um, uh, and those that will tend to survive tend to be in this area. There might be a few around the, the fringe here, et cetera, but they'll be in this area. Um, and uh, that's true at that time. Now, you know, I, I do want to make clear because you said, we're keeping the same number of particles. That's correct. Like when I say we're dumping these particles, the number of particles doesn't decrease, right? Like we're retaining the same number. We're just, um, if we have 100,000 particles, the 100,000 will tend to be concentrated in this area following resampling. It's not like we've dumped, you know, 90 of the 100,000 and we're down to 10,000. Not at all. No, no, we're, we've still got 10,000. We've just drawn them from this distribution and set their weight to one. Um, so following resampling, all the weights of particles are one. The ones that are represented here, um, uh, will, will, they'll tend to be represented in this region at that point in time. But remember that the model evolves stochastically. And so these particles which sit here right now will be diffusing out as time goes on, those particles will be evolving according to these stochastic equations. Um, values of parameters will differ between them because the parameters have undergone a random walk and, and the particles themselves will be evolving stochastically. So the particles will always be diffusing out you know, over time in different directions. And there will be this weighting, which will you know, tend to downplay the ones that are further out. But resampling only occurs when the effective sample size gets too small. So if you, if you have it occurring every single time step, um, that may mean that you'll be truncating off um, um, more uh, brutally than you want. The, you know, sort of the competing outlier hypotheses. Um, but often, you know, in our particle filtering, resampling might occur every 10 observations or every 20 observations. Until then, there'll, there'll be a fair number of particles that have diffused out here because of the stochastics of model evolution. So they'll always be saying, some saying like, uh, you know, I think there's gonna be an outbreak. I, just you wait and see, you know, within a few days, you're gonna see there's a lot of sick people. And um, sometimes they'll be right. Um, sometimes, those uh, those contrarian particles, those naysayers, those ones that say, you know, um, you may not have seen it yet, but it'll be coming, will turn out to be right, and suddenly their weights will be invested in, and uh, and they will tend to to uh, to therefore thrive and then eventually multiply. So, part of the art of particle filtering is not truncating too abruptly. You don't want to throw out everything. It's just like Common filtering. You don't want to just say, well, any, any hypothesis other than what's immediately suggested by the empirical data is implausible. You want to have a certain degree of openness to being wrong, a certain degree of humility. And that part of that is, is having enough stochastics to send some particles out on these sides so that as the model evolves, if unexpected new data comes in, like, oh, there's an outbreak. You've got particles that say, I told you so. Um, I've got this all mapped out, what may be going on, and you're investing in them instead. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's, that's really what goes on at a very practical level. You want some outlier particles that are always you know, willing to consider things that aren't yet shown in the data, but are plausible um, by the stochastics of it, so that 
if something unexpected happens in the data, you've got your understand your hypotheses um, already in hand for explaining it. So just a follow up question. Um, yeah. I understand that the, the model should have a stochasticity, but in the, yeah. when you don't have knowledge of that stochasticity, do you just introduce noise? Yeah, yeah. so you, you introduce stochastics for two basic reasons. And I, I talked about those a bit in my, some of my closing remarks last time, but I'll, I'll just refresh this. There's two basic reasons you have stochastics in the model. One is that you're dealing with certain types of processes. Maybe it's diagnoses process, you know, reporting of cases, which are, um, which are noisy. Um, we see it all the time in our data, right? Um, uh, if you're dealing with case counts in a city, you know, some days will be high, some days will be low. Weekends, it, you know, be, be variable versus weekdays. If there's a snowstorm, people won't go in for testing. And so there's genuinely some st stochastics associated with reporting and, 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 and in fact, data. there's stochastics associated with the evolution of the system, like how it spreads. Um, you know, whether someone went to uh, a big music event or a party or a, you know, uh, a, a sports event, and there happened to be an outbreak there. It's stochastic. Um, and so you have stochastics for that often associated with like infection process. Um, but beyond that, you have stochastics reflecting uncertainty in how certain things will evolve. Uh, contact rate is a good example. Um, uh, maybe how much reporting is done with active case finding versus people walking in. Um, maybe, um, Maybe you have stochastics associated with, you know, the um, the degree to which uh, people are going to the hospital, reflecting if it's been an outbreak, say, in a nursing home versus in in young people. And so you have some stochastics affecting parameter values within certain ranges that are bounded by uh, by choice, and those stochastics will reflect you know, the fact there's variability in the world that you're not gonna be able to anticipate, um, not merely uh, variability of reporting or something like that. And both those sorts of stochastics um, are, are, are things that you're gonna represent in your model. And you want the model foundationally to have enough humility to be there to consider things it doesn't expect, you know, with, with, uh, through the normal equations, the normal, deterministic governing equations that that you might normally use you you want it you want to be open to those being corrected by empirical data and that and so you do need enough uh, stochastics to to help ensure that um, and both types of stochastics play a role and tuning those stochastics is one of the most important things you do with with particle filtering you tune them to give you that really good best performance where if you look at how predictive the model is over long periods of over at different points in time, you want to have enough stochastics. It's actually highly predictive um, in terms of ability to take advantage of the data. So you want it to balance humility and confidence so that it is as fit as possible in um, and doing having prediction of where where the system is going over periods where you know you haven't had data to uh, to train it, but where you can compare what the model produces produces versus what's observed from the world. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's that's yeah, a lot of things. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Any further questions about this? This is awesome that we're getting these questions here. Okay, we're, we're getting, uh, yeah, yeah, question. Yes, good. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. Is it possible uh, to uh, explain uh, resampling on um, uh -huh. Shoyan or uh, Anahita uh, models? Uh, yeah, I mean, the resampling process um, here can basically be explained by this. So, so uh, by, by a graph like this, I mean, resampling, um, so 
So resampling is a matter uh, uh, that it is, is a process you want to undertake when your effective sample size is too small. Um, and uh, at the cost of you know, boring you by repeating something, um, if, you had part of, if you had particles, if you had samples that were way out here, as well as here, um, the samples that will be out here will have very small weights. They're samples, but they have small weights. Um, and the, the, the samples in here will tend to have much higher weights. Because remember, each of these samples is weighted according to the ratio of p of x compared to q of x. Um, so those out here, q of x is much, much bigger than p of x. So it's going to have a very small weight. Here, p of x um, is you know, closer in value to q of x. So it's going to have a comparatively high weight compared to anything here. Now, that's wasteful. I mean, we're, we're using all these. All, all these samples, maybe 90% of our samples have weight you know, less than 0 0.001 or something like that. And the resampling idea is, is quite simple here and in particle filtering. And particle filtering, you have the same thing. Sometimes you have a large numbers of particles that aren't worth beans. You know, they're, they're very low credibility. They haven't explained, a, 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 they haven't done a good job explaining any data points for you know, a month or something like that. They're, they're really, really low weight particles. They, they've, you know, they've just again, 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 they've, they've uh, mispredicted what's going on. Um, here, you know, you, you have similar things. And if, if, if you're in that situation, you want to resample, what's, what's going to happen is that um, you're going to say, okay, we're carrying around too many of these dead weight particles. The effective sample size, and there's a formula for this. Um, the effective sample size is too small. So maybe you say it's, you know, one tenth the number of of particles that exist um, uh, in total. We have a, essentially we're carrying around a hundred thousand particles, but we're only getting ten thousand particles worth of of kind of information out of them because the rest of them are just low, low, low weights. In that case, we trigger resampling. What does resampling do? Well, we have 100,000 particles before and 100,000 particles after. But the 100,000 particles after are just drawn from the 100,000 particles before with a probability given by their weights. And so, so, the resampling process will draw 100,000 samples from this. And guess where those samples will tend to be? They'll tend to be where the weights are pretty decent. There'll be very few of them that are drawn from out here because they have a very low probability of being drawn when you're drawing from them according to their weights. So you're going to get 100,000 particles centered in this region. And those will be your new particles. And they're all going to start with weight one. Um, weight one. Now, we're, we're putting aside their weight now, and we're going to go forward. And that's how it works in particle filtering as well, uh, including those models I shared with you um, uh, in any logic. Uh, the following resampling, you, you basically have a bunch of particles, samples, that are uh, similar to those before resampling that had high weights. But they're all now going to have you know, weight one. And as was asked earlier, that's a pretty um, uh, that's a pretty uh, uh, strong um, sort of thing to do because it discards particles. It discards particles that um, that have low weights now, but maybe could explain things later. So you want to be a little bit careful applying this. Um, my recommendation is to only apply it, you know. Uh, with a very low effective sample size. So maybe it's one out of 10 observations or one out of every 20 observations you apply it. Um, but uh, the number of particles is conserved. You, it's just that your new particles are the best performing ones from earlier. But now those particles then evolve, they're clones of the earlier ones, but they then evolve stochastically. And so they dif diffuse and they, have different hypotheses about what will happen because of stochastics and they diffuse outwards. And, and that's generally what happens. And 
if I go back through my records, I could probably find an illustration where you can actually see where resampling occurs um, a little bit. But most of the time, it's pretty, um, what you see is really when new data comes in, the set of, under, the set of interpretations gets constrained a lot uh, by new data, whether it's resampling based or just updating the weights. Resampling is jettisoning low, low uh, weight particle, low weight particles, low weight uh, samples. I don't know if that helps at all, but uh, resampling is basically a process to avoid wasting, spending, you know, most of your the the data you have for 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 particles and or samples uh, on things that that are very low. Uh, very low probability of, of occurring, very low weight. Any other question? Okay, so, uh, you know, we, we basically exhausted our time here. I do just want to emphasize here that um, that when we, we have this um, uh, in particle filtering. Um, the situation obviously isn't quite as neat as this. Um, first of all, uh, well, what I mean by that is uh, with, with particle filtering, this set of proposal distribution values is not given by a fixed distribution like a uniform distribution. It's not something neat like this. In fact, it's not parametric. Uh, we're not plugging in, you know, draw it from a uniform here um, uh, you know, or, or proposal samples. We're not drawing it from uniform. No, 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 no. That's actually occurring by running the model forward. It turns out for most use of particle filtering, that's what you do. This comes from running the model forward between observations. We'll see where that comes in next time, but, but uh, that's where this comes from, the proposal distribution. The weights will be computed recursively. Um, so we're gonna keep track of these weights and it's gonna be this ratio, but in fact, we're not going to be able to compute this ratio directly. We can't like plug in what Q of X is for a given sample. Um, we, we, we don't have a function Q of X whose density we could compute, nor do we have a function P of X whose, whose density we can compute for a given value. But we have a weight that is guaranteed to be equal to this that um, is calculated in the particle filtering algorithm. Um, and and we maintain that weight um, that that weight here. So there's an overall algorithm where basically we are running the model forward here, and then we are updating the weights um, at the point of observation. So this is this is basically running it forward between observations, and then at an observation when data comes in we're going to uh, update the weights by multiplying it by this, by this ratio. Um, and if the effective sample size is too small, we will perform the resampling. We'll, we'll say, okay, we have 100,000 particles, draw them from existing particles by weight and, and uh, set all their weights to one. And those will be our new set of particles if the effective sample size is too small. Now, um, much of the, uh, the art of applying, or much of the um, uh, practice of applying particle filtering lies in simplifying this in two ways. First of all, you notice right here, we are updating the sampled state by drawing from a proposal distribution, which in principle depends on y of t, the new observation at time t. And, um, uh, and in general, what we're going to do is instead, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say in general, for, for the vast majority of uses of particle filtering, 
what you do here with, with models is you will take the old state and you will just run the model forward, not paying attention to this upcoming time point um, while you're running it forward. So you run it forward until time t without paying attention to what the data will be at time t. Um, it's only once you're at time t and the data is actually available, then OK, now we're going to update the weights. And this is where a further simplification comes in. Um, what we're generally going to do is take this and this to be, uh, to be the, the same thing. And actually, there's, uh, this should be a Q in the denominator uh, here. But in any case, in practice, what we do is we take it so that these two cancel. And all we do is we update the weight of the particle by multiplying it by the likelihood of observing the new data in light of current system state. And so we're going to multiply the old weight by the likelihood function. Um, How do you calculate that likelihood? Uh, so this is the likelihood. So you have to specify a likelihood function. And that likelihood is given. Um, we, we saw this earlier for an example, but I'll, I'll, I'll remind you of this. So um, uh, when we have a given application of particle filtering, we're going to have likelihoods. So uh, these are three likelihoods, for example. Um, uh, the likelihood of infection by pathogen. This is a negative binomial likelihood here. Um, and we will have a, each particle will have a, uh, a state. Um, and we will say for that particle, what is the likelihood of observing this data by applying this likelihood function? This is a negative binomial likelihood. You can use binomial likelihoods, you can use normal likelihoods or log normal, but generally you're gonna have a likelihood which is commonly based on a parametric uh, distribution that says for a given particle state, in this case, it's um, how many people are infected uh, right now uh, or have become infective in the model right now. Um, uh, within the past, uh, say, past day, um, what's the likelihood that I would observe the uh, number of reported cases? And here we're taking into account uh, the reported cases, the number that have been infected in the past, or excuse me, been, uh, been proceeded to symptomatic stage in the past day. And, and there's, a, um, there's a dispersion parameter here. Generally, your likelihood will be chosen so that um, you can compare the model, uh, the model outcome, that's this, like the expected case count or the number of searches that are expected against the observed data. And so you have to formulate a likelihood function. Uh, of the methods we've seen, um, approximate Bayesian computation is the one that does without likelihood functions. MCMC has likelihood functions. So each likelihood says, given a particle state, what is the likelihood of observing the observed data? And you know, as you'd expect, um, uh, for a particle state, you'd have some number of expected cases reported, some number of expected searches performed, and you have a likelihood that relates that Given that's your expectation, what's the likelihood you will have observed the empirical data? That's what the likelihood does. And that is what exactly is, is used here uh, to, to update the weights. We're multiplying the old weight by the likelihood for that particle of observing this new data. And that gives us a new weight. Um, and this is all guaranteed to, to have the weight always equal to the ratio of these two. Um, and there's a long derivation behind why does that work? But basically um, that is maintaining recursively 
the weight always equal to the ratio of the posterior distribution, excuse me, the, it is, it is the, um, the target distribution, which in this case is the posterior to the uh, um, proposal distribution, which is just comes from running the model forward. So um, the likelihood is the key part of, of computing uh, this weight update. That's the most important thing. And remember what that does. Things which have a high particles, which have a high likelihood of, of um, observing the data tend to get upweighted. In other words, they're likely to be high. And so the old weight will grow larger. Yet, um, if a particle's state is such that it expects something totally, totally at variance with the observed data, um, if it expects something which is totally different than the observed data, like you know, only two cases reported and 0.5 searches, and you actually see this many, it, its likelihood will be very small. Um, uh, likelihoods, and if you multiply these to get a composite likelihood, it'll be very small. And then when you multiply the weight by this, the weight will grow smaller yet. So, so that's, the, um, that's kind of the key, uh, key step here is updating the weight by multiplying the old weight by the likelihood will tend to grow the weights for things that are highly consistent with the data. Particles which have predictions consistent with the data will have a high likelihood the weight will grow. Those inconsistent with the data will have a likelihood whose values will become smaller. And this weight computed in this recursive way um, is guaranteed to maintain this nice property that it, it has that. And so we can draw according to the weights and we're guaranteed to get a, uh, a, a, a um, sample from the posterior distribution. I don't so know if that's- that, Yeah, Dr. That Oscar, one, one additional question. So if yeah. our um, mechanistic model, the one that we're using yeah. for prediction, yeah. has some missing component due to lack of knowledge. Like initially yep. in the COVID, we didn't know about reinfection. Yep. So yep. Uh, everyone yep. thought that if you're infected, you're going to be immune. Yep. So even if you introduce in a stochasticity, you would never be able to observe uh, the, uh, like replicate what you're seeing in the data. So how do you yep. figure that yep. out? That's exactly right. Um, so uh, if your model, um, if, if, if your model is simply off in terms of uh, a matter of small degree or, um, um, you know, parameter value for a contact rate or what have you. You can accommodate that quite readily by, um, by having random walks done on the contact rate to figure out, you know, so you have all these hypotheses about what the contact rate, eat all these particles with different hypotheses and you'll favor those, you'll invest in those particles that are quite close. But what you're saying is is very acute point, which is, um, uh, there are times where your model structure is totally off. Um, you're, you're foundationally not capturing something that's really important. You're assuming all COVID cases are reported, or you're assuming that you know um, reinfection is impossible, or that immunity is lifelong, right? Which are pretty similar. Um, uh, maybe another example would be maybe you're assuming all cases are symptomatic or something like that. Um, uh, in these cases, your model is just not going to be able to predict that well. You're going to have particle fields are trying to correct the state, just like Coleman filter would try to correct the state, you know, estimate. It's going to be trying to account for what's observed as best it can, but typically it's not going to be able to do um, nearly as good a job as you'd like. And what, what you're going to see is an inability of that model to track the empirical data. Um, so when you have a well-performing uh, model, um, you're going to have uh, you know, an ability to, to track things, which is actually quite, uh, quite close. So um, an example would be, uh, this lower one here. The top is calibration, so don't pay attention, but something like this. Here, you know, this is a sample from that distribution, sampled according to weight, of course, because that's what we do with particles. And 
it should be able to track very, very neatly what's going on. Um, uh, and you know, you kind of look to your model to reproduce data at different levels. So this is age specific data, for example, and you, you want it to, to kind of match up the empirical data across multiple areas quite well. Now, if, if your model is, is, is quite off, you're gonna get divergence. And you can see a little bit here of this going on, um, uh, like in this, uh, in this case, where it's just not able to capture what happened here. The number of cases for this sixth or so month period dropped suddenly, and the model can't really account for it that well. Um, you know, it's anticipating a, a much slower drop. And no matter what particle filtering did, you had different particles with different hypotheses here, but none of them really thought it would drop out, the bottom would drop out of it like that. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a sign that, okay, something is, it needs to be adjusted about the model assumptions there, maybe in this case with, with reporting or with, um, you know, un unreported uh, uh, infections or, or what have you. But the other thing you do, which is extremely important, is that you judge the model by its predictive validity. And what I mean by that is that you set the model to run forward um, uh, in a way that, when I say run forward, you have data only till, you, you only tell the data about model till now. Um, and you train it with that data. I mean, you run the particle filter till now so that it, it infers the state now based on that data. And then you run it forward. You have data going forward, but you just haven't used it to, to train it. Um, you haven't used it to, to, uh, to inform the model at all uh, in the particle filtering. And then you turn off particle filtering. So you, there's no more weight updates, no resampling, no, no further kind of tweaking of, of of the particle filtering assumptions or anything, you just run the model forward. All particles run forward with no, with no correction, no, no evolution of their weight or anything. And you sample from them over time going forward. Um, sample, of course, according to their weight, because that's the only way sampling makes sense here. And because they are sample, important samples. And you see how well does it match, you know, things going forward. And one of the things we're always doing with our particle filtering models is testing what's called their discrepancy, which is basically uh, a measure of how well they accord with the data. And the most important one to look at is going forward against observed data. But we also use it to look at these periods where we did have data and we ask, how well did it match? So to, you know, in your question, if the model is, is um, has missing structure, it's just not going to be able to, to you know, uh, match the data uh, consistently. And you could tune it and tune it and tune it. And it's just going to tell you, you know, there's something missing here. There's something more foundationally missing. Um, and that's a very useful process to go through. From this very chair, on the opening day or two of class, I expressed the view models are learning tools. And you know, models are useful not as crystal balls so much as ways of helping us think more sharply and consistently about these issues. And one of the best things a model can do is to um, say essentially this theory that's captured in the model cannot properly account for the data that's observed in the world because that allows us to then say, okay, we've got to go better understand what we're missing. And then you start experimenting with alternative model structures where you do have waning of immunity or you do have asymptomatics or you do you know, assume that, that people spread you know, just as much when they are asymptomatically infected or whatever. Um, so it, it, it gets you to kind of try other um, models of what's going on, try other uh, thinking about it. And, and that's what models are good for. They help us 
They don't tell us the truth. They more quickly clue us in to when our thinking is off base, in my view. Um, but um, we do expect models to be able to account quite well for the observed data if they are reasonably competitive in, in incorporating you know, the requisite processes from the world. And these are two ways we hold them up to account. We expect them to match well the observed data, and we expect them to predict fairly well over the near term uh, data going forward, which they haven't been informed by, which, where we, we haven't you know, used particle filtering to tell the model about that. That's two ways we can learn. Uh, we can learn when the model's not behaving well and that we have to correct it. Yeah, so with our particle filtering models used day to day um, for our advice giving, um, most people here know we, we've done that uh, since the beginning of the, since uh, the first, first models of this sort, we, we got results in late April, 2020, and they were enshrined in, in daily reporting and they're still being used. But once Omicron came around, it was like time to go back and revisit model structure because the original model structure is just not going to account for immune evasion and essentially loss of immunity um, that people have suffered because of, um, of Omicron's ability to evade vaccine and, and, and natural infection. So hopefully that's helpful. Okay. We've, we've gone over, um, I'm grateful for your 